people are working with dark entities and that's what this is all about. A giant hole larger than the country of Netherlands has now opened up in Antarctica's Weddell Sea. Beyond the frozen walls of Antarctica, secrets out of this world have been uncovered and nobody can still believe it. From historic secrets that have been frozen for centuries to a map hinting at the end of times. Though not permanently inhabited by humans, extreme explorers such as Roald Amundsen and Robert Falcon Scott embarked on daring expeditions to be the first to reach the South Pole in the 20th century. Join us as we reveal what terrifying discovery lies beyond the thick ice wall of Antarctica. Chapter 1. The Journey to Find the Frozen Treasures Antarctica is a fascinating and cold place that has always captured the interest of many people. A lot of people think that under its deep layers of ice, there could be hidden treasures from ancient civilizations that haven't been discovered yet. Stories about aliens and secret high-tech gadgets in this far-off land are quite popular. While some people think these stories are just guesses without real proof, others are convinced that Antarctica is full of important information about our past, the world we live in now, and the future that we still have to fully find out and understand. This icy land has always drawn people who love adventure and challenging journeys. It has been a magnet for explorers and scientists who have braved its very cold and harsh weather. These brave souls, fueled by their thirst for knowledge and their courage, have ventured into this unfriendly place to solve its secrets. One of the first people to explore this area was Captain James Cook. He was born in 1728 in a small village in Yorkshire and started his career as a simple trainee in the Merchant Navy before climbing the ranks in the Royal Navy. His excellent skills in finding his way at sea and drawing maps, along with his never-ending curiosity, led him to go on groundbreaking trips. Captain Cook's first big journey started in 1768 and ended in 1771. He sailed on the HMS Endeavor, aiming to watch Venus pass in front of the sun and to explore the Pacific Ocean. His work greatly improved our understanding of geography and how to navigate, which was very important for later travels near Antarctica. His second journey, from 1772 to 1775, was on the HMS Resolution and HMS Adventure. Cook wanted to find the mysterious unknown southern land. Even though he got very close to the Antarctic Circle and saw a lot of the Southern Ocean, he never actually saw Antarctica. His third trip, from 1776 to 1779, on the HMS Resolution and HMS Discovery, was to find a way between the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans in the north. While Cook never discovered Antarctica, his maps and knowledge of navigation were a big help to those who came after him. Captain Cook's achievements are well known, but what people often don't know is how his Christian faith influenced his understanding of ocean currents and navigation. Cook's strong religious beliefs were a guide for him during his travels. James Clark Ross is another important person in the exploration of the mysterious southern lands. Born in 1800 into a family of sailors, Ross was a famous British naval officer and explorer of the Poles. He played a big role in the history of exploring Antarctica, known for his important trips to both the Arctic and Antarctic. The series of expeditions that started in 1839 and ended in 1843 had several big goals. These included mapping the edges of Antarctica, looking for new places, and doing a lot of scientific research. They wanted to learn about things like the Earth's magnetic field, the kinds of animals living there, and the land's features. James Ross led these expeditions, which led to some amazing discoveries. One of their biggest findings was the Ross Sea. This large sea goes deep into the Antarctic continent along its coast. It lies between Victoria Land, named to honor Queen Victoria, and Marie Bird Land, named after Richard Bird's wife another famous explorer we'll discuss soon. Ross and his team made some astounding finds, and this was just the beginning of their incredible journey. They discovered the Ross Ice Shelf, a massive sheet of ice floating on the ocean and extending into the Ross Sea along the coastline. This was a significant discovery. 
In addition, they located two volcanoes, which they named Mount Erebus and Mount Terror, after the ships they used during their expedition. This way of naming was a special and memorable tribute to their voyage. Ross's method of exploration was different from that of Captain Cook. While Cook did a lot of exploring, Ross took exploration to the next level. He didn't just find new places. He carefully mapped them and confirmed that Antarctica was a real, solid landmass. After Ross came back, the world's maps were updated with this new continent, making it feel like the world had gotten smaller because we now knew about a whole new area. Next, let's delve into the intriguing life of Richard Evelyn Byrd, also known as Admiral Byrd. He was born on October 25, 1888, in Winchester, Virginia. As he grew up, Byrd became a man of many talents. He was a respected American naval officer, a daring aviator, and a brave explorer of the polar regions. His life was a constant search for knowledge, particularly about the mysterious and icy land of Antarctica. He also put a lot of effort into advancing aviation technology, but Antarctica was pretty much unexplored, so pioneers had to pay it a visit. Chapter 2. An Expedition to the Limits of Human Knowledge Admiral Byrd's life was filled with thrilling adventures and important achievements. His interest in exploration started at the United States Naval Academy, where he graduated in 1912. It was here that his fascination with aviation began and quickly grew into a passion. Byrd became a skilled pilot, which was very helpful during World War I, where he took part in crucial air missions. These experiences made him a prominent figure in naval aviation, known for his creative navigation techniques. After the war, Byrd's love for adventure took him to the unexplored areas of polar exploration, with a focus on Antarctica. His first Antarctic adventure happened between 1928 and 1930, known as the first Byrd Antarctic Expedition. This expedition was more than just an exploration. It was a journey of discovery. Byrd set up a base camp called Little America on the Ross Ice Shelf. From this base, he conducted a lot of scientific research and made bold flights over Antarctica. These flights greatly increased our knowledge of the continent's geography and prepared the way for future explorers. A major highlight of Byrd's explorations was his second Antarctic expedition from 1933 to 1935. On November 29, 1929, aboard the aircraft named Floyd Bennett, Byrd did something amazing. He became the first person to fly over the South Pole. This accomplishment brought him worldwide attention and solidified his place as a leading explorer of the 20th century. But Admiral Byrd's story doesn't end there. His expertise and reputation as a seasoned explorer led him to head the United States Antarctic Service Expedition from 1939 to 1941. This expedition was ambitious, aiming to unravel Antarctica's mysteries through various scientific studies in fields like geology, weather science, the study of ice, biology, and oceanography. They also planned to map unexplored parts of the continent, pushing the limits of human knowledge. This expedition also tested new technologies and strategies for surviving in one of the Earth's most challenging environments. Admiral Byrd's Antarctic adventures reached a high point with Operation High Jump, a major project by the United States Navy from 1946 to 1947. Byrd led this operation, which was the largest Antarctic expedition at the time. Its goals were in line with Byrd's previous expeditions, to conduct scientific research, set up research bases, and test military equipment. But it also aimed to assert American interests in the continent. This mission marked the zenith of Byrd's lifelong commitment to exploration and secured his legacy as a trailblazer in polar exploration. After World War II ended, an incredibly huge and ambitious journey began. This wasn't just a normal trip, but a massive operation involving a vast array of resources. Picture this, a fleet of several ships, airplanes flying above, and a large group of more than 4,000 people, including military personnel, scientists, and support staff. The lineup for the expedition was extraordinary, featuring an aircraft carrier, 
many seaplane tenders, helicopters, cargo ships, and various support vessels. This massive show of force in the empty, icy regions of Antarctica sparked the imagination and led to numerous rumors, particularly regarding the Germans. It was well known that German explorers had visited Antarctica in the late 1930s, with goals similar to those of the Americans, to map the area and record their findings. However, when World War II started, a lot of the information about the Germans' activities and intentions in Antarctica became lost or uncertain. Chapter 3. A Secret German Bunker Beneath the Ice When people think about the German dictator and Germans during World War II, many recall hearing various conspiracy theories. Among the more widely known ones are claims that the Holocaust never happened, or that the German dictator somehow survived and is living in Argentina. Another increasingly popular notion among those who enjoy discussing the paranormal and conspiracies is that the Germans managed to establish a secret base in a part of Antarctica. This base, supposedly hidden underground, was used by the Germans to develop advanced technologies. This intriguing idea seems to have originated from tales of a German expedition to Antarctica. According to these stories, the Germans, while mapping and exploring the region, stumbled upon numerous subterranean caves and rivers. One of these caves was apparently so vast that it was converted into a sprawling city, intended to house not just Germans, but also members of other influential groups such as the Illuminati. During their explorations, it's rumored that the Germans either discovered alien technology or actually made contact with extraterrestrials. Allegedly, they learned how to utilize this advanced technology to construct various weapons. This theory is quite astonishing, especially since there's no actual proof that the Germans ever built such a base or had the capability to do so. In an effort to investigate these claims, geologist and oceanographer Colin Summerhays, along with journalist and historian Peter Beeching, conducted a detailed study. They published a 21-page peer-reviewed paper examining the existence of these supposed Antarctic bases. Supporters of this theory often point to a real German expedition to Antarctica that took place in 1938. Conspiracy theorists argue that this expedition was a massive militarized operation involving several ships. However, the reality is quite different. It was actually a modest expedition with a single ship, primarily aimed at expanding Germany's whaling industry. There's no evidence in German records suggesting any intent to establish a base in Antarctica. Moreover, after World War II started, the Germans didn't return to Antarctica until 1959, long after the war had ended. The crew on this expedition was also too small to build a base of the size that is claimed. Another piece of supposed evidence cited by conspiracy theorists is the Antarctic Treaty, which designates Antarctica as a research zone and prohibits its use for military purposes, including bombing and missile strikes. Theorists speculate why Germany would agree to such a treaty, suggesting it was to keep other countries from discovering their secret base and the research being conducted there. However, there's no evidence to support this claim. Some even believe that the German dictator himself was taken to this Antarctic base. They base this on reports that a German ship reached an Argentine base in Antarctica after the war. Coupled with another popular conspiracy theory that the German dictator escaped to Argentina, they speculate that he was then transported by a German ship to live in this secret bunker. Unfortunately, there's no evidence to confirm the German dictator's presence in Argentina or the German ship's arrival at Argentina's Antarctic base. So why do these theories persist despite the lack of evidence? One major factor is the mystery surrounding Antarctica itself. The continent's harsh and unexplored terrain makes it a perfect breeding ground for conspiracy theories. Since much of Antarctica remains undiscovered and mysterious, it leads people to imagine that anything could be hidden there. Another factor fueling these beliefs is the history of unusual military activities in Antarctica, such as reported sightings of German ships or the U.S.'s Operation High Jump. These events, 
coupled with the scarcity of information about them, often lead people to conclude that there must be secretive activities that governments are hiding. As a result, rumors and speculation flourish, giving birth to conspiracy theories. In many cases, people are simply misinterpreting information or not considering the evidence properly. Now, with more information about some of these military activities in Antarctica being publicly available, people can access the facts about these missions. Yet, many believers continue to exhibit confirmation bias, a tendency to interpret ambiguous evidence in a way that supports their pre-existing beliefs. These theorists often see the lack of detailed records about the 1938 whaling expedition as a sign supporting their views. Many people who think the Earth is flat also believe some unusual things about Antarctica. They say it's hard to go there because the military always watches it. This is because they want to see if there's a wall of ice around the world's edge. Some of these people also think there's a secret German base in Antarctica. The group of people who believe the Earth is flat support each other, which helps them keep believing these ideas. Yet sometimes, things get a little too far. Chapter 4. Bird's Odyssey unmasking Earth's last secrets at the poles. In an episode of a famous American TV show from the 1950s called The Longinus Chronoscope, a very important guest named Bird made some really interesting comments. The show's host, Frank Knight, and his co-editors, Larry Lur from CBS News and Kenneth Crawford from Newsweek, introduced Bird as a well-known explorer and someone who inspired a lot of Americans. They talked about Bird's amazing flights over the North and South Poles and asked him if there were still places in the world that nobody had explored yet, places that could make young people excited about exploring. What Bird said next was really exciting and interesting. He mentioned that there was a huge area, as big as the entire United States, that no one had explored yet. This place was somewhere beyond the South Pole, across from the middle part of America. Bird was really surprised that such a big part of the world was still a mystery to people. His words made it seem like adventures and secrets were still waiting to be discovered at the very bottom of the Earth. This particular episode of the show, which aired on December 8, 1954, grabbed the attention of a lot of people. Bird talked about the possibility of finding new resources and wealth in Antarctica, which made people more interested in exploring it. However, things changed quite a bit in just five years. On December 1, 1959, a very important agreement called the Antarctic Treaty was signed. This treaty set some big rules for how people could visit Antarctica. It said that there couldn't be any military activities there. It encouraged scientific research. And it stressed the importance of protecting the environment. It also talked about things like who could claim land in Antarctica, and how often countries should meet to talk about these issues. At first, seven countries, Argentina, Australia, Chile, France, New Zealand, Norway, and the United Kingdom, agreed to this treaty. It officially started in 1961. As time went on, more and more countries joined in, and now 56 countries are part of it. This treaty is a good example of how countries worldwide can work together to keep Antarctica peaceful and focused on science and protecting its unique environment. The Antarctic Treaty is super important for deciding how people should treat Antarctica. It's important to know that going to this cold continent without permission is illegal. If someone tries to go there without the right papers, they could get in big trouble, like having to pay a lot of money or even going to jail. This might be surprising, especially when you think about what Admiral Byrd and the people on the Longines chronoscope thought about Antarctica. Back in the 1950s, they saw it as a place for brave and important explorers, not just for anybody. Since this treaty was made, the only way for most people to see Antarctica is by paying a lot of money to go on a special trip. This usually means going on a big cruise ship that goes to the farthest places these ships are allowed. And if you're really rich, you might get to spend a little bit of time on a simple beach, getting there on a small boat called a tender. This would be a really special experience. But even then, visitors only get to see a tiny part of Antarctica, not the whole thing. Now, let's talk more about the Antarctic Treaty and the United Nations, 
or the UN, which played a big role in making this treaty. The UN started in 1945, right after World War II ended. Its main goal is to help countries work together in peace, safety, and growth. The UN's logo gives us some hints about its goals for the whole world. When you look at the UN logo, the first thing you see is a laurel wreath. This wreath is a symbol of victory and achievement. It's wrapped around a picture of the continents, which might mean that the UN has achieved victory over these areas. But there's a deeper meaning to it. The round shape of the wreath might not just be a symbol of control, but actual control. It's like the wreath surrounds all the countries and areas, acting like a protective barrier around them. The logo might be trying to say that everything inside the wreath is part of the whole world. Logos are more than just simple pictures. They carry deeper meanings, questions, and sometimes secrets. By using different shapes and designs, logos send messages that have been understood for many years. They don't need words to make their point. The pictures alone tell a story. If we can figure out what the person who made the logo was trying to say, we can understand the message they were trying to send. Now, things we see daily can turn into a full-blown conspiracy that we are all ignoring. Chapter 5. Decoding Symbols. The Mystique and Conspiracy of Popular Logos. Now let's explore the logo of Google Chrome. This logo is characterized by one circle inside another, representing an eye-like shape. This eye can be interpreted as a metaphorical window into the depths of one's soul, or as a mystical gateway offering a glimpse or even a passage into another world. The colors in the logo are arranged in a spiraling pattern, evoking a sense of dynamic motion akin to being pulled into a swirling vortex. However, there's an additional layer to this design. On closer examination, the way the colors bend and curve resembles the shape of the number six. With three primary colors forming the outer part of the logo, it subtly hints at the repetition of the number six three times, thus alluding to the number 666. Moving on to the PlayStation logo, it presents a creative fusion of the letters P and S. In this logo, the P is prominent and upright, while the S appears to follow or trail behind it. This design prompts a curious thought. Is the logo simply representing the PlayStation gaming console, or is there an underlying more ominous meaning, perhaps a play on the word Satan? The logo's shape carries a serpentine essence, giving it an appearance as if it's stealthily advancing towards the viewer. This logo is a part of a broader spectrum of logos that contain hidden meanings and messages waiting to be uncovered by keen observers. Now let's consider the well-known Apple logo. This logo is widely recognized and often linked to the forbidden fruit story from the biblical narrative of Adam and Eve. In this story, the fruit, typically imagined as an apple, was consumed following a temptation by a serpent, an act that led to the infamous original sin. Adding an interesting twist, the first computer released by Apple was priced at $666. This fact brings an extra dimension to the interpretation of the logo, enriching its symbolic significance and linking it to the theme of temptation and forbidden knowledge. We're going back to look at the United Nations way of showing the continents on a map. This map gives us a view from above, with the top of the world in the center and the bottom opposite. This kind of view is different and might help us think about the world in a new way. Instead of looking from left to right, this map is more like moving in circles, kind of like playing a game of Pac-Man. If you imagine wrapping this picture around a ball, it would look like the Earth that we all recognize. In this picture, Antarctica changes from just a white ring around the other lands to its own place at the very bottom of the world, with big oceans all around it. Sometimes the truth is right there in front of you, but other times it's not so clear. Chapter 6. A One-of-A-Kind Map Our tale begins with a man named Orlando Ferguson, who held a deep belief in the teachings of the Bible. His faith led him to create a special map, which he believed accurately represented the true shape of the earth. 
Ferguson crafted this distinctive map in the late 1800s, and it certainly got people talking. Orlando Ferguson was born in the year 1845, in a place called Madison, Wisconsin. He became very interested in designing a map reflecting his beliefs about the Earth's form. In 1893, he introduced his creation to the world. He named it the Map of the Square and Stationary Earth. This map depicted the Earth as flat and shaped like a square. The North Pole was positioned right at the center. The continents were spread out from this central point. Ferguson included Bible verses right on the map to support his ideas, indicating his belief in a flat Earth. Beneath Ferguson's map, Bible verses seemed to challenge the idea of a round Earth. Before we delve into these verses, let's cover some basic concepts. Central to this belief system is Jesus Christ, a key figure in the Christian faith. He is seen as the living embodiment of God's Word. Christians believe He came to Earth, died for people's sins, and through faith in Him, individuals can find freedom. Ignoring His teachings is akin to turning away from Christ Himself. In the King James Version of the Bible, the word foundation appears 86 times. If one believes that Christ created everything and follows His guidance, they can discover the truth about our world, both the known and the unknown. Our exploration starts with the Book of Job from the Bible. We'll skip the usual background details and focus on the parts of the Bible that talk about actual, tangible things rather than symbols. In Job 38, there's a passage where God speaks to Job during a storm. He asks Job why he questions God's wisdom with his limited understanding. God challenges Job to prepare for questioning and asks him if he was present when God created the earth's foundation, whether he knows who measured it or laid its cornerstone while the stars and angels rejoiced. In this dialogue, God is addressing Job, who has been questioning God's motives. This section illustrates how Job, with his limited knowledge, cannot grasp God's actions or his methods of creation. Verses 6 to 7 describe the earth's foundations as solid and unchanging, with defined boundaries. These verses also hint at the true nature of stars and suggest that angels, referred to as God's sons, were present during the creation of the earth, after the heavens and its inhabitants were already established. Next, we turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 7, which Ferguson also mentions on his map. Here, there's a verse about four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the winds. This happens after the fifth seal of a scroll is opened and might relate to something called the firmament. But let's get back to the idea of foundation in the Bible. Returning to Job in chapter 22, there are more verses that support Ferguson's viewpoint. The earth is described as having corners, but its center is covered by something round, beneath which all life exists and over which God walks. Chapter 22 says, In this chapter, it discusses people who don't believe in God. The term foundation here isn't about the physical earth. It's about people who do wrong. They are compared to a house built on unstable ground, and like in the story of the Great Flood, their weak foundations were destroyed. This illustrates how the word foundation can have different meanings. It might refer to the beginning of the world, the base of a nation, a community, or even an individual, depending on the context. Let's look more closely at the Psalms, particularly at how the term foundation is used in a more literal sense. In Psalm 102, there's a verse that goes, This verse highlights several important points. First, it stresses that God is eternal. He has always existed and always will. He is described as the I Am, a concept that means He is always present, without a start or an end. From the earliest times, He laid the foundations of the earth. When we look up at the sky, we are essentially seeing His handiwork. The Bible often mentions different heavens, revealing to us the various layers of the sky and the different realms they contain. For instance, in Genesis 1, it says, Here, God commands the waters to be filled with life and for birds to fly across the sky. The sky mentioned here is not the same as the heavenly realm where God resides. It refers to the sky we see, 
where birds fly below the higher levels of our atmosphere. Isaiah chapter 48 provides a different view. It doesn't just describe the Earth's surface. It also talks about the expansion of the sky, showing how vast our universe is. Isaiah 48 states, In this passage, God is speaking to Jacob and Israel, emphasizing that He is the only one, the first and the last. He explains that He laid the foundation of the earth and stretched out the heavens. When He calls them, they stand ready together to discover the mysteries of this earthly world. What secrets might the everyday things around you hold? Share your ideas in the comments. Hit like and subscribe for more.